Okay, alrighty. Ready to roll. What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live Stream. I got Mr. Nick Chan on the audio line today. Decided to come hang out and chat. How are you doing today, Nick? Yeah, I'm doing good. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Excellent. Um, so today's stream, I want to kind of talk about nano reefs and kind of stability in them. I've had a lot of questions around nano tanks lately, so I figured it would be a good topic. Now, nano, nano tanks are one of those things that's a really easy way to kind of get your feet wet in the hobby, so to speak. I think that and a lot of people these days are more apartments and smaller places, so you can't necessarily have a really big tank. So having a small nano tank is, you know, a really good solution to get get into the saltwater hobby. Um, so yeah, so today, so dude, I actually had a question from somebody somewhere, which I don't know if I still have it open, it was all around nano reefs, but they were basically asking how do those ones stay keep a nano tank stable? How do you avoid those swings? How do you keep everything happy and thriving side of the nano reef? Back in the day, I know there was this big kind of mis... I don't know if it's a misconception. Um, everyone said, big as you can, big as you can, right? Nanos are hard, they're going to crash, they're not stable, blah, blah, blah. So that, I, I kind of feel, is kind of a bit of a false statement, even though it was such a popular, common one back in the day. With a nano tank, I mean, yes, something could stray quicker and easier, but it's also a lot easier to fix something in a nano tank, right? So you got both aspects of that. Um, small volume of water, you know, you dose too much, it could affect it. But at the same time, it's really easy to do a water change in the nano tank, right? It's not much effort. So welcome, guys. Welcome, Gabe, Sean's, Michael, Chance Clark, Inventory King, Blinky Fish, Your Fisherman, Pure Fish Girl, Click Clacks. What is going on, guys? So, big thing to remember. It's stuff can, can, yes, they can potentially happen quicker, but you can also fix stuff really easy, right? If you have an issue, do a water change. And doing a one bucket water change is pretty darn easy in a nano tank and pretty quick. Um, so first thing on stability, uh, number one thing is salinity. If your salinity is off, then it's going to cause a whole slew of issues in your tank, right? So a lot of like when you look at some of your test kits, they're all based off you know 1.026, you know 35 ppt. So if your salinity starts to waver, that's going to throw off your other parameters. So you could, if it's out of whack, you could be getting false reading. So that is something to consider. Um, so yes, you can auto top off your tank every day if you are dedicated. Um, someone else asked me the other day, if you're doing a water change, do you use RODI water or do you use salt water? So I've had the same question for an auto top off. So in a salt water tank, salt does not evaporate, but water does. So what happens is as your tank evaporates, your salinity is going to become more concentrated because it's a smaller water volume. So by topping off with RODI or fresh water, um, you're adding, keeping that water level to salt stable, and which is going to keep everything else in your tank. The first step in keeping the rest of your tank stable. Um, so number one thing is I would I would always recommend an auto top off is kind of like the first thing you buy for a tank, because you don't necessarily want to be you know taking a cup of water and adding to your tank every single day. Absolutely can, but for stability sakes. For you not forgetting about it, for going out of town, auto top off is a lifesaver. Um, how can we take advantage of having an established bigger tank at home if we want to build a nano tank in your office? All right. So for that, um, first thing is first is cycling whatever media you have in your tank. If you have rock, you can take out of your established tank for your nano tank. That's a really easy way to get it basically just about insta cycled. Um, the other thing you can do too, if you don't have that, um, I've used stuff like Marine Pier, Brightwell bricks. You can put those in your sump for a month or so and let them seed with bacteria, and then move that to your nano tank. Or when I set up my nano tank, I took all of my rock for it and threw it in the sump of my big tank for a month. So basically, let everything pre seed. That way, once the nano is set up, I already had a nice, good bacteria colony to work with in the nano. Um, Joseph Reef, does a protein skimmer take salt as well? If you do a wet skim, you will be removing some salt water as well. So that could actually lower your salinity. So if it's taking out salt water and your auto top off is adding fresh water, your salinity could slowly low over time. So that's why it's a good idea to check your salinity. I find once most people have had a reef tank set up for a while, they don't necessarily check salinity all the time. And it's if something's off with your tank, the first thing you should do is check salinity, right? It's something that a lot of people just don't consider. They just assume it's always good. So a skimmer could work, 
but to the say or sorry a skimmer could change your salinity um you know your auto top off if you're not using one it could change it so that little scale so make sure your salinity is stable one thing um ato best thing i've done for the nano yeah 100 percent with you on that one uh did you take some salt out yep ato saved me a lot of time um one thing that i do too uh, oh yeah, so East Coast Reefer dry skimming does as well. It, it will, it just won't take as much out because you're not taking as much water into the skimmer cup. I'm a big fan of dry skimming. Uh, a question I get asked constantly is, do you need a skimmer on a nano tank? So I don't think you need one. Um, one of the biggest advantages is just adding aeration to the water since most of them are very quiet, especially the all in ones. So I took the skimmer off of my nano just because I found it a little bit noisy and I like mine dead quiet. So I'm not using one now. Um, in terms of nutrient export, I just do weekly water changes and that solves basically any issue out there. Um, doo -doo -doo. My Red Sea Nano ATP, I'm assuming that's ATO, went crazy one day. My protein skimmer did that. Thank you. Not sure on that one. Okay. Um, yeah, so the Red Sea Nano does come with a little box with a little bobber on the bottom and that is, it's kind of ATO. That one lasted about two or three days. On mine, I put a five gallon jug underneath the tank in the stand. So that one lasts me like a month, which is great because I can fill up once a month. So that's pretty good. Uh, do you, okay, so Ricardo's asking, do you need to add Coraline for it to start taking off? So Coraline is an algae. It does need to be introduced into the tank. So if you have pristine dry rock and nothing else, it's not gonna grow. If you buy some frags with little bits on it, I mean, that could be enough to start it. Or if you really want the purple, I mean, you could just scrape it off another rock, a snail shell, anything with it to introduce it to the tank will help. Back in the day when I had, um, I had some just like empty snail shells and I like rubbed all over the rock just to get the purple started. And I mean, now my tank's covered in it, so it definitely does work. So yeah, so Nick was just saying, usually comes with frags anyways. Um, okay, so first thing I would always recommend is get yourself an ATO. Uh, the Auto XP, XP Aqua, I always forget what shorter it is, but that one is probably one of your best bangs for your buck because it's super tiny a little dual optical sensor. I think it's called the Duetto. Um, I got one of those right now actually. It works really well. But that's probably, I'm going to say, one of the best bangs for a buck. The, the best kind of reputation overall hobby voted best is probably that Toonzy Nano 35, 50, one, whatever it is. Not cheap. It's 200 bucks, though. So. That one's about 120. So mileage may vary. But those are the main two ones that, you know, I would probably use online. Uh, I'd love to get a Red Sea Venture. Yeah, Red Seas are super nice tanks. Like, they're gorgeous. Just the fit and finish on them. They look classy. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, next thing. Um, auto water change. It combined a reefer's best friend. Yes, Auto Aqua AWC ATO. Okay, so that one is an auto water change and an auto top off all in one. So one unit will do both, which is a really cool way to do it. Um, I haven't used it, but I've heard good things about it. So sounds like Remy has one, so that's pretty awesome. If you can do an auto water change, I'm not doing it, but eventually I will. It is probably one of the best, most stable things you could do in your tank. Because um, every day you're doing a little tiny water change. So that's going to be replacing your trace elements. It's going to be replacing whatever, if you have elevated elements in your salt, it's going to be replacing that. So on a low demand tank, you might not even have to do it. So that might be everything you need right there. Now, if you have a higher demand tank, you might need to start dosing. So we'll get into that one in a second. Um, okay, so Devin, the protein skimmer can legit be quiet if you put a plastic thing under the pump. No idea why it does not come with one. I put it under the return pump as well. It worked well. Okay, so with the return pump, if it's touching the glass, it can vibrate and make noise. So I'm assuming that's what you mean with that one. I think it does come with a sponge or something you can put in there, spacer, but just make sure the tube, nothing's touching to vibrate. Um, so we bought a Reb C. What do you like better, the Red Sea or Waterbox? They're, they're both really nice tanks, honestly. Either one would look awesome in a living room. I am... Hey, Dev, let me throw one in there, because... Um, what do you got? If they're talking nano, like yes. smaller desktop ones... Wait, quick uh, question. Solo... Would you, what uh -huh. size do you consider a nano? What size and under? Ooh, difficult one, I guess. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I would say, for me, for a nano, I don't know whether you class the sumped tank as a nano. It could be all the water, water volume. Mm -hmm. Do you think? So what's the smallest Red Sea? Is that a 40 gallon? I think they have a 10 gallon. They have a 10 gallon? I would say a 10 gallon would be a nano. I'd yeah. say even uh, like something like, um, what's that Fluval Edge? I think that's 20, 
three liters. I don't know what that is in gallons. Um, they have so a six gallon and a twelve gallon. Right. Yeah. I would say something like a two foot cube is outside a nano for me. Yeah, I'm gonna I'd say that's a small tank. Like thirty gallons is that a small tank or a nano? Ooh, I, I that's kind of where I see the the edge is somewhere in I'd that twenty probably, to thirty. Yeah, I'd under. say that's on the edge. Yeah. Okay. But um. When we're talking nanos, or you can even go down, I guess, to picos as well, right? I mm -hmm. think picos is is like a I think really pico, small. I'm going to call less than five gallons, like a couple gallons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would say some of the best tanks I've seen, I know there's the Red Sea, I know there's the water box. Yep. Uh, but when we're talking desktop, rear chambered, mm -hmm. um, I saw some really nice ones in the States, and I'm going to see if I can get them over here in the UK as well. What were they? Uh, they were called the Lifeguard Aquariums. Okay. Nice. And what I really liked about them was that it was opti white glass that had mitered joints on the tanks nice. and they had a really well made rear chamber. And you could buy them bare bones, just the tank, yep. or you could buy them with uh, pumps and, uh, and, and lights and other stuff as well. Nice. So I think it's one of those companies, one of those manufacturers that people don't hear about. So nobody talks about them because they're not talked about. Nobody hears about them. Uh, but definitely, I think if people looked for them, especially over in the States and purchased one of those, they'd be mm -hmm. extremely pleased with them and, and they'd probably get talked about a lot more. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's okay. one, one definite brand and, and range of tanks from, from me to check out if you haven't already seen those. I have not. I will check those ones out later. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, all right. So for me, auto top off is the number one thing for stability in a smaller tank. Um, the next type of thing I would say too is it's always wise to get a heater controller. Um, I don't care what size the tank is. That's the number one thing that can fail and kill a tank. So for me, that's the next big thing. The cheapest one I found that's been good is the Inkbird ones. I did link one in the description. It's like 30 bucks, but um, that's probably your best bang for your buck. They do have one that's metal coated and one that's plastic coated on the sensor. I think the one I linked had the plastic coating on the temperature probe. If you get the one that's just stainless or metal, I know eventually you'll probably have to replace that one. So something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so do 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 Jeff, 150 gallon is a nano. Relative to the ocean, they're all nanos. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, Miguel Reef, can I dose alkalinity since my calcium is not dropping? Um, yep, you can only dose elk. I mean, I've al t historically I've always tended to dose a little more elk than I have calcium. So okay, yeah, Sean Sanders, I just do water changes. So and okay, so water changes easiest friend. In my nano reef, it's probably overkill, but I do a four or five gallon water change every week on it. It takes me like four minutes because I've timed myself many times. If I already pre-mix the water, I literally fill a five gallon jug. I use a nice big hose, suck it out and dump in the new stuff. Done. It takes less than five minutes every week. And that five gallons, four to five gallons on 20 gallons, if I do it weekly, that's like 100% water change a month. If I'm lacking anything, it is replenished. If there's anything in the water, it is basically gone and diluted to nothingness. So it's really, that's why I think nanos are easy is because it's so easy to do a large water change with very little effort and it's going to keep your tank super stable. So that's one of the biggest things I think makes nanos super easy. Um, so nano temp control suggestions. Okay. So for me, I'm using the cobalt neotherm heater. I think I have a 75 watt in my 20 gallon nano. Um, that, that is one of the most stable heaters I've ever used. It keeps it as a digital controller. It keeps it super safe. Now, on top of that, um, I have the e -coral controller, so I'm using that as my temperature controller. In the past, I used to use a Ranko one. Um, Inkbird's the other one that's you can buy them on Amazon for like 30 bucks. So super cheap way to do it. Now, you can have, so it's always want to have two levels of redundancy. So if your heater ever gets stuck on, which is one of the most common things I've seen cook a tank, um, that way the heater controller will cut power to it. So that's your biggest thing for preventing a tank crash. Same with an auto top off. Um, now someone a minute ago was asking if you can do, I forget about, uh, can dose calc as the same times you're dosing. Um, absolutely can. I haven't done it personally. I did try using calc for a while, but it couldn't keep up to my tank's demand. And I was adding too much. My water level was rising. It was like, wasn't keeping up. So I don't do that anymore. Um, I did try with the calcium reactor just for fun for a while though. Uh, <laughs> the number one best thing to improve nano tanks to was a hundred gallon sump. Nice. Um, how much water did you change? We started the nano tank. I just do a five gallon water change every week or two in mine. If 
I'm extra motivated this weekly. If I'm slacking, it's every other week. But either way, that's, you know, 50 to 100% water change in a month. So it dilutes anything. And one bucket really isn't hard. Um, I use the DD Aquarium Solutions Temperature Controller. Nice quality piece of kit. I didn't even know they had one. I'll check that one out later. Yeah, it used to be uh, one that uh, a company they absorbed called Simply Aquaria brought mm -hmm. into the UK. D&D hmm. uh, &D absorbed that company. So the product ranges that uh, that company had became D&D &D product mm -hmm. lines. And nice. that was one of them. Uh, we, we ran a lot of those in the UK over here. So, yeah, they were really good. Yeah, uh, the other thing I was going to ask Bev as well is that we talked about heaters, but um, in the States and other places where it, it gets warm, yep. uh, what about uh, cool. cooling? with fans excellent because uh i ran a, a single fan mm -hmm. on a seven gallon nano and it brought the temperature down by about three degrees which really impressed me for such yep. a small cheap fan so, so uh, that's another thing to consider as well is uh is the cooling 100 percent agree with you okay so nano tank if you live somewhere hot you might not even need a heater um the cooling might be your issue you can buy little tiny chillers however they're not cheap Although I did see one cool thing at Reef of Palooza last weekend. At Rap New York, they had little tiny, I think they're called Petri or Petri coolers. They're the kind they use in like a water cooler. So it was a little tiny radiator about that big with a chunk of aluminum and a fan on it. I thought it was a kind of a cool product. Um, I did record it, so it will be in whenever I get to editing a rap video. I'll show that off. But best bang for your buck is put a little fan on the tank. I know Toonsy makes one that's a little dual one for like 60 bucks that sits on there. If you're handy or crafty, I mean, you can use a $10 computer fan, 120 fan, make one really cheap and easy. So that might even, maybe I'll do a little DIY on that one in the near future. Super easy to do and very, very affordable. I mean, less than 20 bucks, you can have your tank cooled. Could use a big tower fan. Now, if you're using a fan, it's going to, you know, assist or aid in evaporative cooling. So even pointing a power head at the surface and doing more surface agitation will help it evaporate more. Um, or blowing water, a fan across the water. So computer fan, super cheap way. I mean, you can use a house fan, any that type of stuff to help your tank evaporate. What's going on, Greg? Um, or if you get fans here, you can get one of those little nano radiators, those type of things. Not the cheapest, but very cool product. Um, so Inkboard, the Inkboard controller, could you use it to any heater? Yes. Um, most of them are rated up to, you know, a thousand watts or whatever. So for today's conversation on a nano, you're never gonna go over that with a nano heater. So you're pretty safe. Large tank, you'd have to consider what your circuit and maximum loads of what the controller is rated for. Now, as a cheap controller, the Inkbird, one of the models, does heating and cooling. So you can have your use it as a heater controller and a fan controller, which is kind of cool. So if it's too hot, you can have it kick on your little PC fan for you and cool off your tank. I think that's a, a really good solution for, you know, on the budget side of things. All right, got a question for you, Dev. Good, ask away. <laughs> so... Do you, do you think, okay, in terms of the nanos versus the larger systems, mm -hmm. do you think that, which which way around do you think it comes in? Do you think that we get more newcomers to the hobby through the nano yes. tank size, or do you think we get more newcomers to the hobby through the larger tank sizes coming through? Um, I would say nano, to be honest, because... If you're buying a new tank, large tanks are not cheap. If you're, well, mm -hmm. nano could be cheap or expensive, right? I've had a nano tank that cost me 150 bucks probably, and my one now is probably $1,500. So you can have a cheap or an expensive nano. Um, so the thing is then, what, what I'm wondering then, because it's like a double barrel question. This. Yes. Do you believe that if the manufacturers put more products out, more quality products out mm -hmm. for nano, for the nano size systems, do you think that would help more people have more success with nanos and encourage people to buy a nano knowing that they can get a full range of good products with that I, as I well as the bigger tanks because that's the thing i found is like looking at nanos mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be as big as a range of products or good products to help look after a nano as there is with a big system i don't think you need as many products in a nano to be honest um so I see your point and I, I partially agree. I do think there is a lot of companies that are coming out more and more with a lot of nano type stuff. I also do think nano tank popularity is up in the rise. And I think a good chunk of that is because, you know, housing's expensive and lots of people are living in condos and smaller places where you can't necessarily have a giant tank. 
where you can get yeah. away putting a nano tank in. So I honestly think a nano tanks, you know, they're up definitely on the rise. I think more and more people are doing it. It's also a lot cheaper to get into the hobby, right? Like I see, you mm -hmm. know, Red Sea nanos and other types of nano tanks all the time for decent prices for a used one, right? You know, a couple hundred bucks and you can have your full setup going. So I definitely think that one is a good solution. Um, so it is growing. Um, all for reef, best nano dosing product. I mean, there you go. That's another really cool product. Um, I was actually talking to him the other day about getting him on a stream and talk about that because they have their carbo calcium and they're all for reef. But that's basically one product. So you dose one thing to your tank and then there's your calcium, elk, and your mag all in one. So that makes it super duper easy. Uh, BRS did a video on it recently where they compared the cost of all. And on a big tank, you know, it wasn't the cheapest, obviously, but on a nano tank, it's very, you know, a couple bucks a month and there's all your dosing. So it's a really good solution for smaller systems. Um, so, okay, so Tom was saying the hardest thing about a nano is keeping up with the temperature. Okay, so if you have to heat it, um, at least for me, the cobalt and the I mean, it's a little more expensive for a heater, but it's like it's been rock solid stable. Um, now, if you got to cool it, a temperature controller and something like a fan is a very good solution. So it's another good way to think about it and do it. But yeah, so evaporation, so salinity and that are your biggest things. Uh, so I also get asked constantly, like, do I need to dose my nano? Now, I mean, I have talked about this one many times and you don't know if you have to dose if you don't test. If your consumption in a week is less than one DKH, this is me just making this one up and doing it. But you, you could probably get away with just water changes, right? If you're, you know, you do a water change, the elk of your salt is nine. You know, you wait a week and you're down to a little over eight. You know, you do your water change, it bumps back up to nine. You're probably okay. But if it's doing any more than that, I would probably seriously consider, okay, it's time to add a doser or a calc to my ATO or something to dose the tank. Um, all for reef and a small fuge or a scrubber. Forget the skimmer, huge success. Okay. So... I also get asked all the time, do you need a skimmer for a nano? There are some good quality nano skimmers out there. However, the majority of the nano skimmers I find are kind of like, they're okay. They're not amazing and they're not cheap. So it's a harder, I, I kind of feel like for the majority of skimmers, you're better off just doing a water change, right? You put your 150 bucks into towards a couple buckets of salt and there's your next year or two of water changes, right? And you're going to get more bang for your buck out of doing water changes than not doing them and just you having a skimmer, especially on a small system. Um, okay, now he was also saying a small fuge or a scrubber. You can definitely do smaller fugiums or scrubbers. In the past, like on my, what was it? Innovative Marine 30L, like 30L long. I took one of the chambers in the back, I cut off the vinyl in the back, and I put some LED strip lights on there and had a little refugium in the back. And it worked pretty well. So that's a good way to do it. If you have a nano with a sump, you obviously got a lot more to play with because then you can add a little refugium. You know, you could put in a little turf scrubber or whatever you want inside of there. And that LG is going to help boost your pH a bit and it's going to help remove those nutrients. So the two things to consider is having, you know, either your turf scrubber or your chato. The whole purpose of that is to remove nutrients from the water. Now, if you just do water changes, that's really easy to do. So... I honestly feel in a nano tank, just do your water changes and that solves 90% of your issues. You don't need all that equipment, you know, just solutions, the dilution is the solution to pollution, right? There you go. So it's a good way to consider it. <laughs> it. It just solves so many issues, especially on a small tank. It's cheap to do. You know, you're, yeah, you're... this is the first time I've heard that one. Dilution is the solution to pollution. <laughs> it is. That's a good one. That's probably one of the better reef kind of uh, phrases I've heard. I hate the old school ones like nothing good happens in a reef. Uh, was it nothing good happens fast in a reef? I hate that one. Or yeah. uh, if just because it works in one system, it doesn't mean that it's going to work in another system because yep. there's no two systems the same. I mm -hmm. think is another one I don't like. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, Deadlow, like, with the questions people are asking about um, skimmers and, and turf scrubbers and, and Cheeto reactors and all, all of the, the extras on this. Yeah. Um, for me, products on an aquarium is, is like anything else. It's, it's what does it do, what are you going to use it for, and is it needed? Because I have had customers before that have come to me after they've, they've spoken to other stores and, and, and sort of done research in the hobby, and they've said, I've been told this is what I need 
for, for an aquarium, I need live rock, I need salt, I need sand, I need a skimmer, I need a light, I need a heater and so on. And for me, things like skimmers and, and um, turf scrubbers and all that is very subjective. It, it, it Like you said, it, dilution is a solution to issues, but why not? why not just avoid the issues in the first place mm -hmm. so that you don't have a need a solution in form of a piece of equipment that's going to undo your doing right well okay so why do we add a skimmer to a tank oxygenation is one that that one you can't negate that one like it does oxygenate your water which is important now the other reason you add one is to remove your organics your fish poop your uneaten food from the water right Okay, so you're doing that. So your main goal is to remove stuff from the water, correct? You can do a water change and remove stuff from the water. Um, a refugium, you're removing nutrients from the water. A water change removes stuff from the water. So doing stuff like adding refugium skimmers, the main purpose that most people do it is to remove nutrients from the water. So if you just do a water change, you can remove those nutrients. So the thing to consider is how much do you spend on a nano skimmer, right? If you buy the, the fancy Tunesy one, whatever, it's like $180, $200. That's a couple bucks of salt. That could potentially be two years of water changes right there, right? So that's something to consider. Um, I do think, you know, the whole auto water change thing is a brilliant thing because most people are slackers and don't want to do water changes, which, you know, that's been the big thing. How do I not do water changes on a tank? Now, so not doing water changes was the big thing. I don't know. I still think they're good. I've tried not doing water changes for a long time. I've done them. My tank just looks happier when I do them. Even my nutrients are fine. Even just a small one. I don't know. Everything just looks happier. It, it looks. It still looks fine without, but it looks more perky, brighter, you know, more polypy, whatever it is. The tank just looks better when you do them. So I've just come to peace that everything's happier if you just do them. Even if you do small ones, right? It just keeps everything good. But is that the, is that the, what is that that's causing that the, the, that's the thing? Is it because when you do the water change, the water, the fresh water is super oxygen saturated? Could be. You know, rather be than the change, because if you're water changing with the same amount of um, salt, for example, and the mineralization hasn't really been that absorbed by the contents of the, the coral content of the nano, what it could be is just that you're, you're adding oxygen saturated water, which mm -hmm. you're going to achieve through, you know, bubbling the system. And that's why that has the same effect. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, again, it comes back to, for me is, is again, is it, why, why are we so concerned about either having a skimmer or, or water changing, but we don't talk about um, having, um, you know, macro fauna in there Mm -hmm. and good filtration in there and inverts in there and the type of animals that are going to break down the the uneaten food and the fish waste uh, mm -hmm. on a natural in a natural way we always yep. kind of see uneaten food and, and fish waste as the enemy so we need to skim it out but well if you've got enough you know mm -hmm. macrofauna and crustaceans and and crud eating stuff and you've got the bacteria and filter media and things like that you can do it just as well without the skimmer uh, and without water changes if you put the other things in place, right? Yeah. It's even even if it's having those, I don't know. I've honestly just found tanks are happier, even with small ones. Like even my big tank, I would do a five gallon water change out of 160, and I'd do a five gallon water change out of 20 gallon. I mean, just that mm -hmm. little bit just seems to keep things more perky and happier. I don't know how to explain it. I keep saying perky, but the corals and stuff just look better. <laughs> You know, I would put it honestly. I would put it down to the fact that you're taking water out, yep. and then you 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 putting in fresh oxygenated water. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I would I would put it down to. I'm not sure if there's anything else in the water. Can't you know because the if you've made that that tank from the same sort of salt bucket as you're doing your water changes with the water is H2O and and mm -hmm. the salt content is what it is. So there's nothing different going in other than that it's it's oxygen saturated yep. when you're mixing it and because it's fresh water, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's high in oxygen. That's that's the only thing that, that can actually make that difference that you're seeing. Yep. Uh, does Nick have a YouTube channel I can subscribe to? Nick, you don't really do videos, you're slacking. You should. 
I know. I've got a few videos on there, but not many. I need to make more. I mean, I'll have to get a tank set up in the office and, and start doing stuff on there. But yeah, sure. I'm always busy doing clients' tanks, so I don't get to do, do my own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's just one of those things that when I'm, you know, when we when we get asked about um, somebody's system and they've had all the bad problems with a system and things like that, pretty much all all the the things that we that we talk about is undoing the things that the hobbyist has done to the system. And um, in a lot of cases, it's, it's overfeeding, entrapment with the type of rock or too much rock, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, it, it's, I always think um, when people are trying to shoehorn equipment into their systems, like skimmers and, and reactors and, um, and, and uh, algae turf scrubbers, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's usually that they can mitigate those issues a lot easier by readdressing what they're actually doing to the system in the belief that, you know, the fish need to be fed as much as they're feeding. Mm -hmm. um, or they need as much rock in the system as they have, or the extra um, porosity of rock gives them more bacteria, so that's a better thing. But they forget that that also leads to more entrapment, therefore more mm -hmm. decomposition, uh, meaning more nitrate. So yep. it kind of goes against what they're doing in that mm -hmm. way. So sometimes I think if you start from the ABCs, and look at how do I make this system not like 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 trap as little as possible yep. when I feed, and I'm feeding only what the fish need and no more than that. Mm -hmm. And then I have you know a cleanup crew and macro fauna, uh, you know, to deal with with what else will be left. Yeah. And then see what happens. I I bet there'll be a lot less nano skimmers bought or let less skimmers bought in general because people would look at it and go you know what, I'm controlling the prevention of those issues without then the need to put the skimmer on. Yep. However, you know, we I still recommend skimmers for people that want a lot of fish in their tanks, mm -hmm. that want a lot of rock in their tanks, that want a lot of corals in their tanks. Then if you're going to overwhelm that system, yep. then the skimmer is going to help clear up the mess. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, that's essentially what it does. It, it clears up mess. Yeah, so pretty much. To me, it's... Um, you can control that mess from being created in the first place, how, you know, in a lot of cases. So, How well do you feel nano skimmers work compared to big skimmers? Uh, the, I mean, in the old days, we're talking um, airstone generated skimmers, and there yeah. is one, I believe, for available on the market, the glass one. Yeah, the glass one. The That's kind of cool. Wooden airstone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that one works really well because it's a very fine mist of bubbles. So the yeah. finer the bubbles... Uh, the more surface area you've got, uh, the, the the particles stick to. Mm -hmm. um, I think pump generated skimmers. The the problem we've always had is is the way that they work. Um, the the pinwheels chops up the the bubbles, mm -hmm. and you can never get those bubbles to be as fine as from a wooden airstone. It's very difficult. Um, so that's why for me for for a nano. Uh, I would rather, rather than spend the money on a on a nano skimmer for what it's actually going to do, I would say prevent the entrapment in the first place. Mm -hmm. Don't overfeed the system to provide the stuff that's going to get trapped and decompose and and, mm -hmm. and turn into nitrates. And like you were saying, water change. You know, that's the way I would I would do it. Very 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 simple. You're not overcomplicating it, and you're not like then relying on equipment to do a job that you've already mitigated you know mm -hmm. so okay so start starting with that nutrients get into your tank from you what you feed what you add to the water that's all what's creating nutrients in your tank right mm -hmm. so i mean not overfeeding is a very good first step right so don't don't put in too much food more than you need to and that's going to save a good chunk right there um mm -hmm. so don't overfeed first step um, step number two, if there is nutrient levels, I mean, you could employ a skimmer, you can employ a refugium, different things to suck that stuff back out of the water, or you could just do water change. So, uh, so two and three, nines of fours are great. Bubbles are super fine. I've never used one, but lots of people recommend that two Z one. Um, and supposedly it's pretty quiet. I debated buying that one for, I think that's the one I was looking at for the Red Sea Nano. But then I decided it's cheaper to just do water changes. Uh, <laughs> so a couple of different ways to do it, right? And that's the beauty of the hobby is there's so many different ways to accomplish the same thing. 
So, okay. So we got, okay. So ATOs, we got auto water changes are awesome, but ATOs is number one. Next would be heater slash cooling to keep your tank stable, right? Um, water cha change, if you could auto water change a nano, I think that'd be the easiest thing you could ever do because it's a big stability factor right there. Uh, Kelly, has anyone checked out the new Red Sea lights? Considering them, I have seen them at shows. They look pretty nice. I'm still on the fence about the lack of the color channels, but I do appreciate how the LED is more recessed and you don't really see it. That's my quick. I thought that as well, Dev. I couldn't get any specs on the actual diodes used. It's the, they don't have. It's very Kesselish. Um, all the diodes they have a strip of white down the middle, and they have the blues around it, and it's all under one lens, similar to a Kessel. There, but yeah, I do like how it's recessed. I think that's cool because you don't see the light at all mm. from the side. So it's nice that it doesn't like blind you or bright distracting. So that I really like. Yeah. Um, I'm still on the fence on their spectrum choice though, of because it's very Kesselish. Like you can have a blue or a whiter. That's all you can do. Um, well, the only thing that I saw on the spectrum graph, so that I know, it not, it's not widely known how to look at. I wish. I wish we could get somebody on your show, on your live stream, Dev, that would explain to people what those graphs mean and how to read them, mm -hmm. you know? Because I, when I saw the spectrum graph, it, the, the blue band was very narrow. It was it was a very thin, tall peak uh, that had a little bit of bleed into the, the sort of like UV range. Yeah. Um, and I noticed there was no secondary chlorophyll absorption uh, bandwidth at all. Yeah. Um, but... <laughs> I don't know how many people understand that, and I don't wish to sound condescending, but I wish we could get, um, you know, people on the live streams to kind of explain spectrum graph, because I know everybody gets hung up on par and per, uh, and and being able to understand what that graph means that's printed in the literature on the side of the box actually mm. would give a lot of people help. Yeah. Um, that sounds like an so, excellent so, feature live stream. I like it. Yeah, because if you look at the different fixtures and you look at the, the spectrum graphs and you put them side by side, you can see a big difference between them all. Mm -hmm. But um, people have got to understand that uh, some manufacturers have amazing marketing and promotional yeah. teams and other lighting companies don't do a good job of marketing. But So just because a light is talked less about than other lighting doesn't mean that it's an inferior product. In some yeah. cases, I've seen some lighting that gets no mention at all but the actual performance of the light mm -hmm. is really good, you know. And it, I think um, for people to know what to spend the money on in terms of performance of light, mm -hmm. you know, going past the fancy advertising, going past the fancy controllability of the light mm -hmm. to actually the nitty gritty of what is my coral going to receive from this light, I think um, that that needs addressing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think I like your idea of how to read the graphs properly. I think we're gonna, I'm gonna find someone to do that, like who's like expert at it. Like I only kind of half know, so I'm not even gonna attempt to claim to fully understand it. I got the gist of it, but I'll see if I can find someone that's more of a lighting expert to bring on for do that. Because I think it's a great idea for a future stream. I like yeah, it. I think um, I think I know in the past I've mentioned it before Dev, about challenging manufacturers, mm -hmm. you know, into you know, making things better for the hobbyist in terms of our understanding and what to look for, as well as making products and then telling us how great it is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if they can kind of explain it better so that a hobbyist is armed with more knowledge and information of what to look for, then it's like when you go to buy a car, you know, you know what you're looking for. It might be a big trunk. It might be a good engine performance, you know, mileage. Mm -hmm. It might be that you want to tow a trailer or a caravan so it has to have good talk but generally when we go to buy a car or another product we know what we want from that product mm -hmm. and i think that's the thing with with lighting in particular in this hobby is it's almost a, for some not everybody you know but for some it's a guessing game they they buy that light because they've been told it's good or they heard it was good or it looked good you know rather mm -hmm. than actually I know this light is going to give my corals that I have, these particular corals, what I need it to do. You know, that that's where I think with lighting in particular, it's one of those pieces of equipment where I'd love for people to understand it more for their benefit, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay, most lights with a decent output are going to grow coral, right? 
I, I don't care what brand it is. Majority of the decent lights are Coral will grow. Uh, if you don't have enough light, if your par is too low, they'll likely be more brown. They won't be as colorful. If you have too much light, you're going to bleach them and kill them. So within the range of lights, most will work. You know, your Kessel is going to work. Your Red Sea is going to work. Your Radians are going to work. Your Z light is going to work. They're all going to grow corals. Your Reef Brights are going to work. Whatever. They're all going to grow. Um, the, the fancy features, they're nice to have. Um, so part of what you pay for with a lot of them are going to be... Some of them's ability to tweak it, you know, some of it's app, some of the form factor, you know, is it big and bulky or is it nice and sleek and compact? So that is an exception. Um, you know, like the Kessel thing is, the Kessel attitude, the, the new one, they've added more color channels, but they've always been, okay, we can have it bluer or whiter. And the Red Sea approach is, is bluer or whiter. So for, for that aspect of it, I think they're kind of being like, okay, you know, here's the areas we know that can su success, if, if you know nothing what you're doing, you play within the zone, you'll still be okay. Which, I, I partially appreciate that approach. Um, then you got something, some of the other companies where you can control all the colors, all the spectrums, whatever you want. Now, do you need greens and reds and these other colors? You don't need it. However, I mean, there is certain benefits to some of them. One thing that I always consider, too, is if you look at... A, a leaf on a tree it's green because it reflects green so adding those colors in can make those colors pop more in different stuff so anyways completely off topic right now um so as firm as stability <laughs> somebody was asking about a big tank and a small tank and if you could do a water change from one tank and use it for the next tank um absolutely could if you you're kind of not really a nano anymore but if you had a small tank close proximity to your big tank if you could plumb the sumps together i mean that's ultimate stability because they're all one big system um, since Rabbi's on here, I'll give you guys a sneak peek of my, my future excitement for automating stability. Dun, 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 dun. I survived the plane trip. I'm excited, but I got a reef bot and I'm super stoked because that's going to go on the big tank to test all the stuff that my Alcatronic is not testing. So kind of excited for that. So I just got to order my test kits and get all the stuff prepped for it. Um, but yes, any of the big lights, <laughs> Harkins, Red Sea wants you to not kill corals as an approach. Um, that pretty much goes for all companies, I think. They don't want you to kill corals. Successful reefers are good for business. If you succeed, you're going to stay in the hobby and you're going to keep using products long term. So I think most companies want you to be successful. Certain ones are just, you know, a lot of companies are realizing that now and they're starting to make products that are easier or help guide you or templates or stuff to get you over that hur hurdle to make you more successful. That's pretty cool. Um, if the coral color is too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So very true. Um, ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. So near future. Because I know a couple of you at the beginning of the stream were asking about the reef bot. Uh, I'm stoked for it. My current plan, because I have, okay, I have an Alcatronic, which tests. Now, if you did this on a Nano, it'd also be extra awesome because your tank would be crazy stable. But I got the Alcatronic, which tests my elk every 12 hours. Um, I'm using Calcium Reactor, so I don't really care to test Calcium as much because it's always good every time I check it. It just is what it is. Um, so I think I'm going to set it up to test Magnesium nitrous and phosphates so because if your magnesium's out of whack it's going to mess with other stuff so it's a good one to keep an eye on uh, another thing most people don't pay enough attention to is magnesium if you're dosing way too much elk or calcium or something that's crazy out of balance it usually means your magnesium's low so testing magnesium making sure my calcium reactor because i do have some mag rocks in there making sure that's dosing a proper amount keeps things in balance is good so i'm going to use that for magnesium and then nitrous and phosphates just to make sure my nutrients are in the happy zone so I think I'm going to let it test those once a week, and I think it's going to be a sweet setup. So I'm stoked for that. Um, my elk is 12. Hey Beth. Yes. Sorry, and just a quick one. Um, another thing as well for people to consider is I know a lot of people in terms of um, the chemistry and more parameters, like you're saying yeah. calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, etc. They always look at the, the corals. Um, one thing I always find interesting is is um, people forget about the absorption of the the rock scape. And mm -hmm. there's a certain point when you've set up a new system, in particular, that you'll you'll hit an absorption of mineralization by the the rock itself, mm -hmm. and people forget about that, or they don't they're not aware of it. So a lot of the times I get customers and they're saying, 
I don't understand why suddenly I can't keep up with calcium, I can't keep up with magnesium, it's dropped through the floor and no matter how much I add, it, it won't seem to go up. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's usually because the, the rock has started to absorb it, especially if they're forming uh, coralline algae, uh, that really sucks it up. So it's just another thing to consider is, is to watch what's going on in your system mm. aside from just the corals that you're putting in. Oh, yeah. There's other uh, stuff in there that use, utilizes it as well. If coralline algae takes off, it can suck a surprising amount of calcium and algae. Like if you look even in my background, like the, the rock just, you know, in the middle of the screen there, you can see like a massive layer of coralline algae. It's just caking over the rock and that's sucking up a bunch of nutrients. Um, doo -doo -doo. So whether... You need to dose a tank, which is the next level of stability. Stability for your corals depends on what type of corals you're keeping, right? Like a water change may be enough. If it's not enough, then you could look at something like calc or dosing or, I mean, calcium reactor is overkill for nano, but I mean, it's another option, right? Uh, why was there so little amount of content from Reef Plus this year? Oh, there's content. I have 170 gigabytes of video footage from this weekend, but... I've been home for a day and a half and I am still half recovering from lack of sleep. So there will eventually be content. <laughs> so lots coming. Lots to come, lots to come. I haven't even went through it all yet. I've literally just copied off the SD cards yesterday. Uh, hey, Deb, I was yes. just thinking um, uh, Jake Adams yep. from Reef Builders. Yep. Uh, a long time ago now, he did a really good article uh, forgotten which um, which which uh, uh, website it was on, but it was about uh, him having a small nano with lots of coral in there, mm -hmm. and he did 100% water changes. He yep. had no filtration, no nothing, I've just done water changes on yep. it. But it's like 100. It was like a lot, you know, big water changes. That's all he did on it. Mm -hmm. um, I've never asked him about that tank. I read the article, and um, that formed the basis of. of some of my maintenance with uh, with the nano sizes and the pico mm -hmm. sizes uh so, but that might be an interesting one if you can get jake on to talk about that particular tank because uh, i think he learned you know uh, looked at a lot of stuff with that system okay um on that same note before i did my i used to have a innovative marine 30 gallon long nano reef borderline nano um now with that i when I was buying my big tank, so my 100-gallon tank, so not the tank, but the one before it, um, someone was selling a bunch of big colonies of coral. And at this point, there was not a hope and chance it would fit inside of my nano reef. You know, it was a good deal. I wanted these corals, but there's no way it'd fit my tank. They lived for like a two months in a five-gallon bucket with a heater and a powerhead. That's it. I just did water changes on it every week. I did a big water change, or every couple days I did one, whatever it was. I can't remember the frequency. But so that kept corals living. No rock, no filtration, corals, water, powerhead heater. Set. So it's, it's as simple as you can get, like the simplest tank in the world. And stuff was fine. It's just water changes, right? So it goes to show how far that is. Now, another good, speaking of nano reefs, um, worldwide corals on their counter, they have like a two and a half, three gallon little, awesome little nano reef, super tiny little tank. And I think they just do 100% water change on that, like every like three or four days, so like twice a week-ish. You know, a couple, couple gallons, tanks, beautiful, awesome little tank. All they use water changes. So on a small tank, water changes are cheap. Um, so that's a really good way to do it. So I'm still a big proponent of water changes. I know so many people don't like them, but they just do so much good. Um, okay, so what's a good temperature for a reef tank? I keep mine at around 78, 79. 77 to 80 is kind of the range. You don't really want to go too much outside of that. You absolutely can. You can, you know, I've seen tanks lower closer to like 76, 77. I've seen 80, 81. But when you get to 82, 83, that starts being on the top end of where I'd want to see a tank. What do you keep your tanks at, Nick? Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I keep mine on the top end. Um, okay. But that needs some explanation as well. Um, the issue you've got with keeping a tank in a high temperature is the effect of the water and also the decomposition. Mm -hmm. So a uh, high temperature, you're going to get a, a faster rate of decomposition. Therefore, you're going to get more uh, ammonia and nitrate and nitrate. So that has to be counteracted. And also, uh, water of a high temperature doesn't hold oxygen as well. Mm -hmm. So that's usually why people guide hobbyists into having it in the sort of lower temperatures 
because you have to take into consideration other things other than just the water being warmer. Mm -hmm. it, it then has sort of, you know, sequential consequences. So you have to be aware of those and counteract those mm -hmm. in order to have warmer water. But I find things do well under warmer water conditions as long as you mitigate, you know, the, the lower amounts of oxygen saturation and, and faster decomposition and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we experience in the UK is during our height of our summer, we get a week or two of, of higher temperatures. So what I tend to do is acclimatize the, the tanks sort of like a month or so before mm -hmm. to a higher temperature, you know, start injecting oxygen, mitigating the, the, the waste and everything else so that when it does hit those higher summer temperatures, I'm not so concerned about trying to cool all the tanks down, which is I find harder mm -hmm. to try and cool the tanks than to heat the tanks up. So that's that's why I tend to do that and again recommend that to, to customers and things to do yep. as well. So I had a conversation recently on one of the Facebook groups about temperature in a tank and stuff. So something because they're just saying, okay, my temperature increased, so my, my elk dropped. So temperature mm -hmm. kind of affects the metabolism of stuff in your tank, your fish, your corals, basically everything. So the higher the temperature, the higher the metabolism, the higher metabolism, potentially higher growth. Um, your bacteria mm -hmm. will grow faster. You know, your corals are potentially growing faster. They might be sucking up more parameters. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can play with with the temperature to an extent. Um, you obviously don't want to push anything on either end of the spectrum because that could lead to trouble if you're riding that line. So, you know, somewhere in the middle is always the happy place, but, you know, higher temperatures up to a certain point will encourage corals to grow a bit faster. Same thing if your tank's, you know, fully grown, cooler temperature might slow down the growth a bit, which might be a good thing if you're getting pretty limited for space. So a couple different ways to think about it. Um, so we say my temperature goes up and down 24 and a half to 26 and a half. That's actually, that's not bad. Oh, that's, what's 26? 26 is probably a little bit up. 26.5, 26. Uh, is 79 yeah that's fine so 26 and a half is 79.7 my tank for instance is at 78.7 right now so you're, you're okay uh what's 24 though what's the other end of that spectrum so 24 so 76 to 76 to 79 so that's a bit of a swing um if you if your tank's been used to that and you're that's what your corals are used to i mean you're probably fine um, reef connects. It will also affect pH, which will affect alkalinity. Very good point. Um, so your pH level will affect pH and elk actually are tied pretty well. So having a higher alkalinity will also give you a bit of a higher pH. So there's some correlations there as well. That's the other thing for me, Dev, is, um, you know, we talk about skimmers and, and algae turf scrubbers and all those to, mm -hmm. to offer benefit systems for one of the, the cheapest pieces of kit that I think, I believe offers the most benefit, and mm -hmm. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier with the skimmer, yep. was to have an air pump and mm -hmm. a wooden air stone, even if it's just in the sump, bubbling away on its own and you're not using bubbling method, but you just got an air stone in the sump bubbling away. Mm -hmm. You know, a cheap pump is gonna cost you what, 20, 30 bucks, yep. and an air stone is a couple of bucks. Cheap. But like you said, you know, the skimmer is aerating to an extent, mm -hmm. but even just an air stone with a little air pump in the corner of the sump, just doing nothing else but bubbling away, is going to offer so much benefit for a system, mm -hmm. you know, beyond this cost. You know, I'm surprised more people don't see that as an essential piece of kit for what, for what it offers and what it does for the system. Okay, so two things to consider. If you need, you want better oxygen exchange within your system, um, First thing to do, if you don't have much surface agitation, point, direct your flow, direct your power heads more towards the surface. All those sur surface ripples are going to promote gas exchange. So that's step one. Um, so, okay, step one is having it surface tension to bring it in. If you have little waterfalls in your overflow, now that will make your water splashing a little bit louder. Some people like the water sound, some want it silent. But any type of that agitation is going to add on and give you better oxygen exchange. Now, if you're bubbling the water, there's a certain point, whether it's from your air bubbler and your air stone, or if it's from water agitation, where your CO2 concentration is going to equalize with the surrounding 
air in the room. Now, if you're only drawing from outside your cabinet, it's it could reach that equilibrium. Now, if you have a high CO2 content in your house, you might not get a lot of benefit. So the first test that you can kind of do is, you know, just open a window in the room and let that natural air flow inside and outside. And if you see a big boost in your pH, then the biggest thing you can do to increase the oxidation, increase that pH is draw outside air. So if you, there's anywhere you can sneak a little tube up to your outside, you know, what's to a crack for a window. I have a little tiny one that was coming through where the gas lines from my fireplace. I snuck a little RDI line in there and hook that up to my skimmer. So my skimmer is doing that outside air draw. Or if you don't have a skimmer, you can use like an aqua lifter or some kind of air cylinder that has an inlet on it and an output. And you could bubble that to your system. But you're, it's creating gas exchange with air with a lower concentration of CO2 than what's in the surrounding air. So that's going to give you the benefits of increasing more oxygen and lowering more CO2 out of the water. And, you know, increasing your pH is what why most people would go that route. Um, roof kinetics or a pe pellet here, thank you, for a pico or a nano is a good option. Better than a regular chiller. Yeah, regular chillers are overkill for a nano tank. Those little pe pelleter ones are, are very cool. It's basically what's inside of like um, a water cooler machine. So you have a little little block where you pump your flow through it and it will, you, some of them will heat or cool, but generally it will cool your water really quickly. They gave me a little demo at wrap and they put a drop of water on it and after about 10 or 15 seconds, it turned to ice. Like it's crazy how much those little coolers can do. So it's kind of impressive. So that is a good one. Um, budget solution, just use a fan. So super easy. So two different little styles or ways for cooling your tank. Sorry, that kind of blended two different topics there. Uh, what else you got, Nick? What else is key for stability for you or in your eyes? I lost them. There Sorry, go. I'm here. I was just boiling the kettle and it's noisy, so I'm muted. <laughs> um, cup of tea. I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, cup of tea time. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it just goes back. See, the reason I love um, people starting off with nano so much is that you're in control over it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be in control over a nano because you can water change and make a big difference to that system and reset the system with that water change. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy a couple of fish and then you can buy a couple of corals and feel like the tank is filling up straight away. It's yeah. costing you a lot less money to stock that tank. Mm -hmm. And if you knew... Just adding a couple of fish and a couple of coral will give you enough to do to learn, you know, about controlling the water chemistry mm -hmm. before you move on to a bigger tank that is going to cost you a lot more money in rock, in equipment, in fish, in coral to start looking like anything. And then suddenly you've got a lot of money in that system. And if, you know, things start to go wrong, Mm -hmm. then to water change and readdress that is more expensive. And if it goes wrong to a point where you start losing fish, you, you know, that can stop people from wanting to be in the hobby anymore because to undo all of that seems to be very, you know, time consuming and, and expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was in the States, I was in a, one of the stores and uh, chatting to a guy and he, he had got ick in his mm. system and he was talking about the benefits of dosing copper mm. and leaving it you know fallow and and all this stuff and i asked him how big is your system mm -hmm. and he said oh it's uh it's like uh, 30 gallons mm -hmm. and i said i'll be honest with you for for the sake of 30 gallons of salt water i just you know get the local shop to take the fish um, and treat it for you in their tanks that, you know, do it, let, let them do it and then just reset the system, you okay. know, drain it and restart it. Even if you purchase new sand, new rock and give it a good clean out and okay. put fresh water in, I need to... instantly it's gone instantly. I need to go you have on. No queries, you know, quabbles or anything else. I need and to... it's very cheap and easy to do. All right. You know? I'm going to go on a small rant. I see so many posts. <laughs> I see so many posts about ick in systems. If a fish is healthy, it should have no problem fighting off ick. Ick, ick is likely in most systems and stuff. So when it, what a fish has a slime coat on itself, there's, there's a slimy coat on its body. And now, if a fish is stressed, it's usually lacking that slime coat, or it's thinner, or it's not as thick there. 
So usually a fish will get ick if it's stressed out or something's happening with it. If a fish is healthy and it has this good slime coat, you know, ick tries to go on it, it's going to stick that slime coat and just kind of get wicked off to, to an extent. So you're talking about copper and fish only and blah, blah, blah. Do never put copper in a tank that you intend to put corals into, right? Um, corals and copper are not friends. They don't get along. Um, copper is the main thing that's the copper or cupramine, which is just copper in it, is the main thing that people use to treat it because that copper will kill it and get rid of it. However, if there's ever going to be corals in that display tank, you never want to use copper because that's going to potentially kill future corals and give you all kinds of issues. So coral tank, never use copper. Now, if you're stressing the heck out of your fish, trying to catch it to treat it, you're just weakening its immune system and potentially giving it to stuff. So if you have a store, you're just talking about stores and quarantine in a store. So if you have a store that will pre-quarantine with you, that's an excellent option. You know, don't just go buy the cheapest fish that you can. If you have a place that pre-quarantines, make sure they're healthy for you. That goes a long way to preventing issues in your system. You know, if you buy a fish, you know, it's eating, there, make sure there's no spots on it. Make sure it looks healthy, no cloudy eyes. Like, just give it a good look over. Before you buy anything, sit there for 20, 30 minutes and watch the fish. Make sure it's healthy and make sure there's no issues. And you prevent yourself a ton of headaches. Um, I, I just see so many things about people. They're like, oh, it has ick. And then, you know, they're chasing with a net and trying to catch it to treat it. And they're just stressing it out and just making the solution worse. So nice, happy, healthy fish should be able to get rid of it. No problem. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I like it when you rant, Dave. I don't hear yeah. you do it often. I know, I know. You know, it's I love to rant. I'm always ranting. It's true. <laughs> I just see so many things about ick, and and I feel like some of these people that stress out and about it, all they do is cause the fish more stress, which doesn't help the cause. Keep your fish ha yeah. happy. You know, if there's no fish just picking on it, it's you know, it's well fed, it's eating, it has its little caves to go chill out for a while. All these things are going to help it kind of kick back, and it'll just go in its own. You know, if, if you're... But the other, thing, the other thing I noticed as well, Dave, is um, if a fish doesn't look well, mm -hmm. uh, and I know this is the temptation to do, so it's difficult to tell people not to do it. Yeah. What happens then is people shove the faces up to the glass to see if the fish is getting any better, like multiple times a day, that then, like you said, scares the fish. Yeah, like... <laughs> so we're trying to do what we think is right by monitoring the fish and shoving the faces up to the tank that in itself causes it more stress yeah. and, and, you know, may make it worse. But mm -hmm. what do you do, right? And that's a natural kind of like, thing for any hobbyist to do is, you know, look at the fish that's that's sick, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, the other thing about what you're saying about the local fish stores where I'm purchasing fish, mm -hmm. um, the, the best piece of advice I, I think I could ever give anyone, when you go to a store, and I know this is difficult because sometimes you visit stores that you never go to and you drive hours to get there. So you see a fish you want to buy it there and then. However, if it's a local fish store, one that you regularly go to mm -hmm. and they've had a shipment in and you go there maybe every week mm -hmm. and they have this particular fish that you haven't seen before, you've been waiting for or, or they have and you go, wow, I want to have that fish. Yep. Most stores that I know, decent stores anyway, would allow you to purchase the fish and leave it with them for a week, two weeks, three weeks, even four weeks. And I always think that it's better sometimes to, if you, especially, especially if it's known to be a finicky type of fish, like a copper band or a butterfly or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Antheus, some Antheus are very finicky as well, difficult to get to feed, uh, regal angels and so on. Buy the fish mm -hmm. and leave it with the store. Yep. for weeks mm -hmm. and let that fish settle and recuperate from yep. being shipped and, and everything else. And it's, it's, they're feeding it for you for free. <laughs> you know, they're looking after it for you for mm -hmm. free. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. most times when you think about the history of anybody that's got experience in the hobby and look at the history of when you, you've had a fish with white spot or you've had a fish that won't eat or an illness, it usually comes about within the first week or two of buying the fish. Mm -hmm. and then you realize there's something not right with it and it affects the other fish in the tank. So even just by making a, 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 a tradition, if you like that, when you go and buy new fish, you purchase them and you ask the local fish keeper to keep it for two, three, four weeks. That's creating a buffer in the fact that if anything then goes wrong with that fish, 
I doubt the local fish shop would say, oh, well, it's it, it's tough. You you bought it, you left it with us, and it died. It, it, tough. Well, I think uh, most uh, local fish shops would say, we'll give you that money, a store credit, or or we'll get another one in for you. That's that's what I think most decent shops would do. Well, most places will hold the fish for you, right? If you say, okay, here's 20 mm-hmm. bucks, hold it, I'll pick it up in a week or something, right? Like a lot of places will yeah. do that. Like if you give a deposit, most places are fine holding it. Just to make sure it's mm-hmm. good, especially Absolutely. if a shipment just came in. You know, it's, it's wise to wait a week or two. You know, sometimes you look at a fish at the store, they're like, oh, yeah, we've had that one for about three weeks now. I'm like, oh, that's that's an extra boost of confidence knowing it's looking good and you've had it for a while. So Exactly. Yeah. Another thing people don't realize is that um, when fish are shipped, especially from source to mm-hmm. the distributors, um, they actually fast the fish. So they don't feed them yep. uh, for for days. And mm-hmm. the reason that is, is because when they're transported in the plastic bags with water in, mm-hmm. um, if the fish fouls the water, um, it, 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 it kills, you know, it gives them ammonia burn. Yep. So most most shipments uh, in the water, they will put things like ammonia binder and, and things like that. That's why you see fish with the, the blue colored water or yellow colored water mm-hmm. um, from from source to the wholesalers. Yep. And that's chemicals in there to uh, alleviate the, the, the effects of ammonia and, and stuff when the fish uh, pass waste or leaching mm-hmm. through the gills. So in a lot of cases, when the shops get them they might still be recovering from being fasted Mm -hmm. so just for that reason it's like ammonia it's like if ph drops or or there's ammonia in there the effects of those things can take a while to be evident so Mm -hmm. i've seen fish die after a couple of weeks Mm -hmm. because they actually the the gills suffered from ammonia burn and what happens is the gills slowly react and, and produce a, like a, a, a slime, if you like, to, mm-hmm. to cover the burn, or the burns get infected, um, or the fish suffocates because the slime produced by the body's defense system uh, tries to cover the, the injury mm-hmm. and ends up suffocating the fish. Yeah. But that can take a couple of weeks to happen. So, you know, you go in and buy that fish and it looks okay, yeah two weeks later it's dead follow and there's nothing that you could yeah and there's nothing that you could Mm -hmm. have done to prevent it but it just unfortunately takes that length of time for the the fish in a way to kill itself Mm -hmm. okay um so the other thing with ph swings and stuff is is um it can actually produce like a kidney and liver uh injury really which again you wouldn't see yeah you wouldn't see that swings however you'd see Mm -hmm. you'd see the 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 inevitable repercussions of it weeks mm-hmm. or even a month later okay so moral of the story story if your store pre-quarantines bonus do it if the fish is ten dollars more pre-quarantine who cares do it you're gonna have that fish for 10 15 years possibly so what's 20 bucks over that right so i will definitely pay you know an extra 20 bucks if i know the fish is healthy and i don't have to worry about quarantining all that other stuff um you know quarantining is a good idea however i i question if a fish has an issue if it's like you know ick or something to spend you know hours trying to catch him and stress how okay i don't put him in a quarantine tank i question that to be honest um if you want a pre-quarantine i mean that's never a bad idea however if a store will do it for me bonus that's worth the extra little bit in my eyes um to make sure the fish is healthy before i even introduce it to your system especially if you have an older established system next tip if the st- if a fish is fresh to the store that day day before you really want them throw down 20 bucks and say put a deposit on it i'll pick them up in two weeks you know let, or longer whatever you want to do most stores you know if you have a good relationship with your store they're going to be okay to hold them for you you've already you know put down a little bit of money so they know you for sure want them so that's another good way to do it um do, 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 do. So another I- one as well that for me is um Feel free to question the store. Any decent shop will be proud and to explain what it does for the welfare of its livestock. Mm-hmm. So ask them what medication do they give the fish to uh, get rid of flukes and intestinal worms. Mm-hmm. You know, most decent shops will medicate the fish I know what... um, against natural parasites. One of my yeah. LFS is that sadly is no longer here. They shut down, but they used to pre-quarantine stuff for three or four weeks before they even bring into the store, which I thought was awesome. So mm-hmm. sadly, they're gone now. It makes me sad to see an LFS go away. But that was a, yeah. a that was one nice perk of that one. 
Um, okay, so back to the nano side of things. Since we went down the rabbit hole of fish and treating stuff, um, don't overstock your tank. If you want a tank that's easy and low maintenance, don't have a crazy high bio load of fish. Um, also, get fish appropriate to your size of tank. Like you don't want a big fish that produces lots of waste in a little tiny tank because that's just going to increase, you know, the waste load and you know water change or skimmers or whatever that rely reliance is on that filtration export. Um, Saint Nova, quick question: How fast do rock flowers grow? I am feeding two. Um, I have no idea how you'd relate it. My little baby rock flower that was that big a month or two ago is probably like bigger than that size now. I don't know if that means much in a couple months. I'm going to say a baby to a full grown one somewhere between a closer to a year, year and a bit, not full grown, but to a decent size. Um, yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know how to percent to quantify it, but a baby to a size that you'd buy in a store is probably about a year old. Rough guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do, do. Dave, so, what do you love about um, nanos? What is the thing that I you love? really enjoy about having a nano? In a big tank, the micro life gets lost. Sometimes I've also... I was about to say the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it gets lost. <laughs> exactly the same thing. <laughs> you don't concentrate on the tiny things as much. Like, I have little sexy mm -hmm. shrimp. I mean, I have a horse and crab in my nano in my big tank. I forget about the one in big, my big tank. Once in a while I see him, I'm like, oh yeah, there he is under that little overhang. Then, you know, the little guys in the nano you'll see more often and you'll like investigate the cracks more to find all the tiny creatures. So it's a different appreciation, right? So a big tank, you're like, yeah, big corals, tangs, all these big fish. And a nano, you're like, oh, look at that little invert. Look at that little crab. Look at that little guy. You can see the little firefish pecking at my ear right now. Um, like, yeah, I, I have three fish right now. <laughs> I have the purple firefish that's right beside the zoas right there. Hiding in the back behind there is a, oh, there it goes. It's a royal gamma. And I also have, I don't know if he's in there anyway. Can't see him. And I also have a mandarin in there. Um, I have the little tie-dye looking mandarin. I think they're called green mandarins for some reason, even though they're the tie-dye. And aside from that, it's mainly just inverts and stuff. So, you know, three fish, fairly low bio load. That's probably the most I'd ever put in that little tank. And what would you say would be your your uh, best recommendation for a nano tank in terms of livestock? Say for like for example, fish. What what fish do you think would look great in a nano that would be lost otherwise in a in a bigger system? One of the okay. Um, so some of these recommendations have caveats because some of them rely on pods. So. I also culture mm -hmm. pods and feed it to the tank every couple of weeks. I just dump a bunch in. So that's a bit of a caveat. So I can get away with a little more stuff in a small tank. Um, blue streak pipefish are really cool. They're really tiny pipefish. Oh, yes. Nice. I had some of those. Unfortunately, when I was out of town for a while, something happened. They disappeared. I somewhat theorized that it may have been my army of emerald crabs I have to get rid of the Belle Village at one point, but that's unknown. Mm -hmm. So... Those are super cool fish. Another really cool fish that I had was a fla flaming prawn goby. Super tiny ah, goby. That was going to be on my list. That big, beautiful, fish. beautiful crazy fins, big, he was just wild looking. So super. It's like a mini dragon, right? Yeah. But even in the nano, in my 20 gallon nano, I hardly saw him. He's very elusive. I got excited mm -hmm. when I saw him because you see him like once a week. Like if I had a. That's one of the things I like about that fish because it's like, a you surprise. know it's there or you hope it's there. And then when you think it's not there, it shows itself and you go, oh my God, it's still alive. I jump off the couch <laughs> and go stare at the tank because you're all excited. Exactly. You're like, oh, he's there. That's what I like about, that's what I like about reefing is mm -hmm. that it's not really all the fish that are on show. It's that something that you is very elusive and you only get to see once in a while and then it's extra special when you see it. Right? It is. I, I get off my couch and run into the tank. I'm like, there it is. I pull up my phone and try to take a video of him because he was like the most elusive fish I've ever owned in my life. It's so like once a week yeah. you see him. I'm like, hopefully he's eating, hopefully he's alive. And you're like, ah, there he is again. And you get all excited. So that's with a nano. I think it's cool to have all these little creatures that would be lost. You'd never see in a big tank. That's one thing. I one find of my cool. favorites for a nano would be uh, a pom-pom crab. Pom-pom crab. Okay. You know, there is a pom-pom crab in my nano. I kind of forgot right. I had one because I, I haven't seen him so long. Things. And then one day he's like exactly. chilling by a nam. I, I was like, oh things. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And you can get little uh, anemone crabs, mm -hmm. um, even like coral gobies and, and stuff that are, are really tiny, mm -hmm. really, really small. 
but in a nano or pico setting you know i think those things are perfect and again mm -hmm. they don't add a lot of bio load but yeah. you've still got that and hook of fascination to to be sat there in front of this tiny tank mm -hmm. looking for all these tiny things you can have um, a lot of nano fish too right like um there's tons of little gobies that are like an inch inch and a half you know you can have a bunch of those guys and there's like nothing for bio load so which is cool because i would rather have a bunch of super tiny fish than a couple big fish because i think it's cooler to see that scale of all those little tiny things everywhere what about corals then Beth? all right so the biggest okay here's a plus pro and a con so my only big complaint about a nano tank is you eventually run out of coral space <laughs> if you're addicted to coral and you keep buying them eventually you're gonna run out of place to put it that is my one complaint to do with the nano um my rock i'll show my rock flowers i have like 50 rock flowers on there which is amazing and now they're starting to grow they're starting to fill out and my sand bed is getting covered and it's freaking amazing i cannot wait my i'm just envisioning though the day that i don't even see my sand it's just rock flowers it's gonna be glorious um but they're starting to if you look up right there you can kind of see one climbed up the rock there there's another one there there's another one on the side there so they're starting to like climb up the rock a little bit which is kind of funky so, I mean, I might eventually start taking out a few more of the acros and throw in my big tank if it gets too overrun with rock flowers once there's all kinds of baby making happening. But, I don't know, I think it's cool. So far, so good. The rock flowers, the zoas touching, they don't seem to care. There is another one up touching my bonsai acro. Uh, purple bonsai, or garf bonsai, whatever it's called. So, I'm curious to see if that affects it or they sting each other or what. If it does, I'll just frag off a chunk just to save it. But I'm kind of just curious to see what happens with some of those how they affect each other but nanos are fun and the one bonus is you know you can buy a little frag and it actually looks big in a nano because it's all to that scale right exactly so some yeah. of the slow growing coral when you put them in a nano mm -hmm. also it doesn't look like you put a fingernail and put it in your six foot you know when you put it in a nano it's a you look know, at that tiny colony it's like your tiny frag Yeah, so I don't know. The, the, the scale is nice. I mean, it saves you a lot of money because your smaller corals look bigger and it has more impact on that scale. So definitely. So what, what about um, feeding then, Dev? Yep. What do you think would be a good way to feed a nano? I broadcast feed, but I also have a lot of rock flowers. I'm trying to make sure they eat and hopefully entice them to spawn more often. Um, I don't... I feed pellets once in a while. I don't feed them all the time. I do tend to feed frozen the majority of the time. Um, I also, the reef nutrition stuff, I've been feeding a lot and making random cocktails lately because it's tons of like natural-ish particle food, which is good for small fish and small stuff. So mm. I've been doing a lot of random stuff. Yeah, <laughs> Harkins. Uh, what about phyto? Do you put phyto in there? Yep. Probably like once a week. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I probably put a lot more than most people would in their nano, but this is me trying to feed all the rock flowers and get them in the mood. So I'm still experimenting with different food sources and different things and to try and find magical solutions to increase the, the rock flower romance in the tank. Um, have you tried, um, oh, what's it called now? Uh, coral smoothie? Have you tried that yet? I have not. Who makes it? By Algogen. It's a company called Algogen. Okay. And their slogan is feed the frenzy <laughs> nice. um when we had that stuff over in the uk mm -hmm. yeah that stuff is awesome it's really good there's certain seasons as well they'll do uh, a clam mix okay uh, but they only use Ooh. like natural stuff so they don't always have that one available it's only in the season they can get the clams and interesting uh, well, sorry check that out oh, it's okay. really good food yeah, i'll, check that I'll look that one up one interesting one is um reef nutrition makes one called oyster feast and that right. one i find actually it entices a lot of corals feeding responses um mm. so i've been playing with that one a little bit mixing i got to use it more i forget to use it all the time but i find that one works well because it's a very very fine particulate that a lot of acros polyps like a lot of stuff can eat so i've i gotta start using that one. i'm gonna try using that one for a couple of weeks straight and see how that works with the rock flowers but anyways there's certain yeah pe catalyst that's another really good one uh, someone just mentioned it. Catalyst is good. I don't know if it's something in the oils or what, but that's another really good one. I don't know if it's a lot of amino acids, but there's something in there that seems to really trigger feeding responses for corals, which is a good one. Catalyst is, uh, I always regard that as a superfood. Yeah, it's um, those little. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a really good, really nutritious mm -hmm. um, food, that one. Um, I know in the UK, 
uh, the company that Michael Aaron's works for has just released um, uh, a reef beast mm -hmm. food product. Nice. And that has a, a cannabis in it. Um, yeah, that's something you can buy just a tub of cannabis, I believe. I don't know if you can get that over over the pond, but yeah, definitely a superfood that one. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of the times I'll, you know, mice, this is kind of like my standard go-to dinner time food for the fish. I'll add a little bit of cannabis in as well, just cause you know, it's little particulates for the corals to eat and rock flowers and little fish and everything else. So plus that feeding response is always a good bonus for it. And so feeding, but yeah, I feed so much random food. I think variety is the key to it all. You don't want to eat the same thing every single day of your life. And you get different nutrients from different foods, so mixing up is always a bonus. All right, I think we covered a good chunk of nano stuff today. If you do guys have any questions, let me know. Um, probably wrap her up sometime in the next 10 minutes or so, so get those questions up if you got anything I didn't answer yet. Uh, triggers, massive fe feeding response, and all my picky fish come out to eat. Yes, yes, it does. Yeast isn't an amazing food to get fish to eat. Yeast, eh? Um, I've heard rumors that yeast is in a lot of the coral foods. I've never tried feeding like straight up baking cooking yeast or brewer's yeast or any other yeast. Be interesting though. But I've heard those kind of rumors that that is a chunk of some of the commercial foods or at least part of the filling. Um, another interesting one. I got some of that, that Benepets reef food from the show as like a sample to try out. So curious to try that. So I've tried feeding that a little bit. I've, I've heard some some rumors that it keeps your glass cleaner and stuff, so I need to know this, because if it actually does, then it's pretty sweet. So, who knows? Jury's still up. But, I fed it last night. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. What else we got? What did we, what did we miss? Um, do you use any pump for circulation in your Red Sea Nano? Yes, I do. Um, right behind the little notification thing, above the top corner of the screen, I got a, you can kind of see it, but it, I got the Nero 5 in there. And it works well. It's only running at like 12, less than 20%, probably like 12 or 15%, but no, it works pretty well in there. Super tiny. Um, what did you do, Dev? I heard that um, with the Nero, and I saw, a, I think, a post by a guy who said that a smaller fish can get trapped in the back of it or can swim through the back of it. Did you no, not at all. Th there... Foam or anything on it? or Not an issue. Um, if you look at the back of it, it's it's concave and it's a very small area by the glass and it's a honeycomb shape on the back. Um, it's, most power heads are a full grade on the side or be easier to get sucked to it. This one only really sucks from directly against the glass. Um, zero issue with that. Um, now, okay. Now, is your nano? Yeah. So I mean, the tank in my background right now is my nano tank. Now, another kind of semi pro tip here. I have the. Do, 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 do. So they don't advertise as waterproof, but the Nero or the magnet for the back of the Nero is sealed and looks identical to the one that goes in your tank. Mine's that little concave to it. Um, I have that in my rear chamber in the overflow chamber. So I have it on my back wall. So you don't, there's nothing on the side of the tank. You don't see poking out. It's basically black blends in with the back wall. So it blends in it nice. super stealthy. And that's one thing that I like about it. Um, it has very broad flow and it, the one cool thing, I just for fun, I put it on, when I did a review on it, I put it on my 160 gallon tank. And I was able to, the magnets obviously, it's rated for 12 mil. The glass on my big tank is 19 mil. So the magnet was very, you know, barely held it there. But I'm way over the rating. However, it was able to push and rock the whole water column in my 160 gallon tank. So you can use it in a 20 gallon tank and a 160 gallon tank. So I think that's really cool. If someone like, I mean, it's not the cheapest pump, but I think it's an awesome pump. And the fact that I could use a, a 20 gallon and upgrade my tank in the future and use a bigger gallon, I think that's a really big selling kind of feature for the pump. But I do like it. Bit of a tangent. Okay. Uh, I like Benefits food. It won't raise my phosphates like others. Good to know. I uh, love Benefits, but I don't know why people say it helps your glass. I don't either. Uh, Mark Levinson, Milo's Reef, was touting that. I don't know if he has some magic going on there, but he's the one that kind of piqued my interest. I was like, hmm, I need to try this. We told about that food, but um, we can't get it over here in the UK. I can't. So, I couldn't find a cannon either, so I just grabbed some at the show to try. Mm, yeah, I'll have to see if we can uh, touch base with the, the, the mm -hmm. company and see if we can get it over here. A lot of the random foods, it's usually like one ingredient that makes it a issue to import, or there could be random stuff. But mm. yeah. 
So usually that's usually why some places you don't find as much, or at least there's more hurdles to import it because there's like some random ingredient that's something questionable for human consumption, but they don't consider it for fish and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I love that you could rock your big tank. Yeah, exactly, right? The fact that one pump could work in a nano big tank makes it extremely versatile. And I think that's like one of the yeah. biggest cool features of that tiny pump. And it's broad flow. It's not direct. It does like a big, like, whoo. So I don't know. I think the reverse stator is a really cool pump. Um, prior to that, I also had the Coral Box RN1, which worked pretty well. It was bigger than that pump. Um, it almost felt a bit too strong. Like it felt like I couldn't turn it down quite as far. Hey, Shyster Adventures. Welcome to the channel if you're watching. Um, so that one, it was bigger. So it wasn't as sleek. Um, my only problem is long term, it got a bit of like a squeaky sound to it. We replaced the impeller, fixed it. But long term, it just became a bit louder and I had to replace it. So um, I also had that one before it was released to kind of try it out and do a review on it. So that one was sent to me. So long term that so it may have changed or they may have changed the impeller or something in the newer production models. Can't say for sure. Uh... What would you say that if there was one, Bev, what product would you like to see made for a Nana? What would I like to see? Or, or yeah, or product hmm. that you think is limited in choices say for example i don't know uh a, a decent light or a decent something or what product would you like to see made for a nano that is a good question i think we have good lights i mean mm -hmm. we've got good options for flow i mean i'm starting to see nano return pumps that are dc and quieter which makes me happy i, I do mm. think we have most things the one thing i think is lacking i think not all. I mean, there is some good nano skimmers, but I feel like the majority of them are mediocre. Like they're not like an amazing yeah. skimmer. Like they're they just okay work. So I'm gonna say that there needs to be more high quality nano skimmers. Like I I took mine out because I'm like, eh, it only kind of works. Like it works, but meh. Um, Kelsey Reactor. Uh, Aquamax makes a Kelsey Reactor for a nano. I haven't tried it. I don't know if Anthony's huh. still in the chat, but I know at one point he talked about buying it. If you bought it, Anthony, I'm curious to know how it works. But. Uh, Marine Depot sells Aquamax and they do make a nano calcium reactor. So I'm curious if anyone's used that. How's it work? Um, anyone use a gyre for a nano icebox or max spec? So a cool thing, uh, Moki Inappropriate Reefer, he had one of the little gyres and he just took off one side. So it only had one side in it. So that's how he made like basically a nano one. So that's another good solution. Do 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 do. So, all right, guys. Well, I'll tell you what, that's what I'd like to see is max nano spec make a single yeah like a single head yep um so you don't have to take one side off and then feel like you've just lost half your money but if they made a, <laughs> a single unit mm -hmm. like nano size that would be awesome yeah it would be i'm sure we'll potentially see it eventually but mm. yep and if anyone orders the nano calcium reactor let me know how it works i'm really curious and we're in deep sells them there's a code in the description for 10 percent off let's throw that out there um, I had a friend who loved it. Ah, good to know. Good to know, Greg. It's funny with, here it is, Aqu Aquatech C Nano. Hmm. Look it up. It's 150 bucks. It's not even that expensive. Um, your CO2 regulator and tank and everything is probably the same price as the reactor. So you're probably into it for about 300 bucks to set it up. Um, then on the flip side, you spend a hundred, 100 and something on, ah, Infamous is here. Did not buy it, but still thinking about it. All right. If you buy it, let me know later. I'm curious. Greg, ask your buddy. I want an update on it. Because I've always been curious, because most people say calcium reactors are worthwhile on a large system. And I tend to agree. And that's more because of the upfront cost. However, on that one, it's 150 bucks. Um, a CO2 tank, you know, another 100 bucks. Your regulator could be another 100 bucks. So you're into it for what? Two, 350, 400 bucks. Um, a cheap dosing pump like a Jabo is 100 bucks. You buy one of the fancier brands, it's three or 400 bucks. So it's not that big of a gap. So yeah, I'm curious. Uh, Nathan got those water sensors working today. Work like a charm. Awesome. Appreciate it. Good to hear. I'm assuming that's the, the DIY Neptune ones. I did a video on a couple weeks ago. Uh, okay. Harkins dev. I have a customer who has the micro calcium reactor and works well. Nice. Excellent. World Aquarium Singapore. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the stream. Ah, so it's good to know people are having good success with the nano one. That's kind of cool. You're making me question if I should try one on the nano one day. <laughs> More toys for da, 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 da. the only problem is <laughs> like the reactor itself isn't bad at all 
It's just the fact that mm. I need to buy another CO2 tank and regulator. And that's what adds up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, Gabe, I'm about to get the Kamor Wi-Fi doser and more all for reef. That's a great solution for the Nano. Like, a single pump head. Uh, it's not in here. I have the little coral box with a single dose head. And the Kamor ones, you know, probably a little better built. That's another good option with single head, ultra reef, one dosing pump, Nano. That's a really good way to go. I should have grabbed some of that Alpha Reef at the show. I'm curious to try that. But one thing the dose is just so simple. Keeps it all in balance. It's a good way. Good way to do it. Um, they also make a powder, so you can mix your own, which is way cheaper, way more economical. So that may be another good way. I mean, it probably lasts you ages on that one on a nano tank. Um, how many SPS frags before you start dosing? Um, so if you are doing regular water changes, it depends on your salt. So if you if you use a salt with elevated levels, your water change alone may be enough to supplement it for a while. Um, I don't really know what the number is. I'm going to blindly say if it's more than one DKH swing over a week, I would start dosing. If you go, you're nine and a week later you're eight, you do a water change, you're back up to nine. That's still a little bit of a larger swing than I'd like, but that's the point where I'd be like, all right, do a doser or your calc or your tiny calcium reactor, whatever you want. You're all free, but something to supplement. Um, ideally, you know, less than half a DKH would be perfect, but anything closer to one DKH swing between water changes, I would start dosing. Uh, can I cycle rock in my sump to start a nano? 100% can, Drew. Um, that's exactly what I did before I started my tank. I threw, I kind of roughed up my aquascape and I threw all the rock in the sump for about a month before I even had the nano tank just to kind of pre-cycle it and get all that good bacteria going. So it's basically insta-cycle by the time you set it up. Um, all for Reef is best for now. Yep, 100% agree. Super cool product. Um, and I am going to get him on the stream one day. I talked to him about it at multiple shows now, so eventually I'm going to do it. I think he'll be good to kind of dig in more because a lot of people have asked me too exactly how it works or how it doesn't precipitate. And it's all to do with like the type of calciums and stuff in there. And I think it's the whole carbocalcium is slightly different than like a calcium chloride. And that's kind of how... Somehow they get that magic so it doesn't precipitate. So, what um, product is that? Though? That's the like the all for reef for the carbo calcium. They're kind of like the all in one dosing things from. Uh, not Fa is it Fauna Marine? No, what's it called? My blank at the moment. But yeah, look up all for reef. Yeah, I look at that. It's cool because it's one dosing solution that doses everything. Tropic Marine. Um, yeah, so it's cool. Yeah, so, yeah, Lou is a good guy, and I've talked to him actually two days ago when I was at Rap New York about coming on a stream, and he's all for it, so I think that'll be a good one, because I'm still kind of half curious. Like, I kind of half understand how it works, but not fully, and I've been asked a bunch of times kind of for more details on it, so I think that will be a good one to dig into. So that will come in the future. I will set up a future Wednesday for him. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, guys. All right, guys, I think that is a pretty good one today. We've been at it for... Just about an hour and a half now, so way over my 45 to 60 minute summertime live stream goal. But it was a good chat today, so I think it was good. Um, yeah, if you guys enjoyed it, as always, hit those like buttons. If you got any questions, let me know in the comments below. We can dig into it to a future stream. Uh, Gabe, he changed my life with that bottle. <laughs> uh, can't use it on a big tank. You can use it on a big tank, it's just expensive. But it's brilliant for a nano. So, yeah, if you guys have anything specific you want us to dig into further or on a future stream, let me know in the comments of this video after the fact for whoever's watching it. And you enjoyed it, hit the like button, you're new, subscribe, and I guess I'll see you guys on the next week's stream. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.